Uh, let me step up because they're working on the microphone right now. And uh, there it is. There it is. There we go. Thank you, Representative Otto, our co-chair here this evening. Uh, I'm a little late. I want to tell you why. There's a fellow by the name of Rod Jennings who's on the school board. He helped save a police officer's life in Normandy, Missouri. Uh, and so the Missouri House of Representatives passed a resolution signed by the Speaker of the House. And they said, well, I, I said, well, I have a meeting. I have to begin at 7 o'clock. And they said, well, we begin at 7. I said, tell you what, let me come over early. Let me come over early. And I was able to give Rod his award. He was very heroic. A police officer was being attacked. He went to the police officer's aid. And uh, he uh, helped save that police officer's uh, life. And so that's why I'm a few minutes late. I want to give him that award. And he's a member of our school board. Uh, we have two members here of the Missouri House of Representatives. I'd like to especially recognize them. I know they have other things to do tonight. They may have to leave early. The fact that they care very much about this issue, uh, Representative Otto and I care very much about, and I'd like you to welcome them to Sharon Pace from District 74. Sharon, I tell her to share. Sharon. Uh, Sharon's had quite a bit of experience. She's uh, been either four or six years in the, the legislature uh, and uh, has a lot of work, particularly in the area of law enforcement, uh, economic and development, and so on. And then we have a brand new representative, pretty new, just served his first two years, Courtney Curtis. Where's Representative Curtis? There he is. He may be small, but he is mighty. And he, is, uh, he serves with me on the Ways and Means Committee, and he asks tough questions about our economic situation here in Missouri. I see Doug Clemens, good, good evening to you. A lot of good friends here tonight. I want to know also, are there anybody here who is an office holder in a school board, a city council, uh, or uh, any elect other elected official that I, we may have missed in introducing uh, you? I want to do that now if you are here. Don't hesitate. Okay, the it's the public who's here tonight. It's not the not the official dumb dumb. That's that's good. Uh, my wife Linda Locke. Uh, Would you say hello to her? She's the one that really is. Uh, when anything good comes out of my office, she has a lot to do with it. And uh, also, um, oh, Fred, you, Fred Hanks, would you say hello? Just Fred. This our new my my new uh, legislative assistant. Came over to be with us uh, tonight, and now we'll get to. And I appreciate all the work that he's done for us so far. Now we have uh, sodas, we have ice, so I think just make this part informal. If you want to get a soda, you want to get. We have water. We did receive a bit of criticism once because we were using plastic bottles, so we changed. We brought that disposable unit with us uh, here tonight. So. <laughs> So for the environmental, uh, environmentalists among us, you should be pleased. And I think everybody here tonight is an environmentalist, right? That's one of our reasons that we're here. We're concerned very much about uh, the environment. Now, I'm going to be doing what most of you are going to be doing, and that's listening. I don't consider myself an expert on this issue at all. But we do have some real experts on our panel uh, tonight. Uh, here's a chalkboard if they need it. Uh, I'm going to begin, and I'm going to let uh, Representative Otto kind of uh, uh, give an opening statement. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak about seven minutes to introduce yourself, and then that'll take us near the bottom of the hour. And then we're going to open up for questions between uh, the parties and then the general public. Bill, what do you say? Does that sound good to you? All right. Now, we have one problem in this place. This is really a nice place to be. It's centrally located. The people are really nice who run the place. And we have, uh, but we only have one microphone. So when we get to that time when you want to ask a question, then uh, I'll ask uh, my legislative assistant, Brad, or somebody else will take the microphone to you so that we don't have to do what we just did at the very beginning. 
you know, we can't hear you. you know, but make sure everybody hears the statement, everybody hears the comment. Um, we're going to try to break officially around 9 o'clock. Um, and uh, and I, I hope some of this, uh, if some questions are not answered, and we may not have all the answers here, we may not even have some of the right questions. That, but all of us are concerned about this fire and the situation up at the near the airport. Uh, that we'll write those down. So, Doss, did you have did you have the, the three by five cards? Mr. Doss will be able to pass out to you along uh, uh, with other members of our, of our staff to uh, get your questions and maybe we can keep you on a mailing list, uh, whatever. Have we covered the ground rules to start? Uh, uh, go ahead, Bill. Let's let Bill say something and welcoming to everybody first. Too. This is Bill Otto. I have the honor of serving with him in the legislature. He's going to be one of our, our future leaders, I think, in the, in the Missouri House. I really believe that. So here you go. Think about this. I'm a 57-year-old freshman. <laughs> so I don't know how much of a future I have, let alone a leadership position. But uh, let me first tell you, I, I was so pleased that uh, uh, Rory wanted to have this panel here in, in his community. Uh, this is a long way, theoretically, a long way from, um, from the landfill and the radioactive waste. And that's really what uh, the, the primary topic will be tonight. Um, but, but as the crow flies and as the wind blows, it's very close. And you all know that. I can tell by the shaking your hands. You know the impact of what would happen if that radioactive waste were to get airborne. You know the impact of what would happen if for somehow that got into the atmosphere or got out into the communities. And wind predominantly blows west to east. And if you go a straight line, we're right here in this part of the community. The only thing I was going to say is on the panel, what we're going to do, uh, I'll, I'll make some remarks and then we'll just go down to the panel and let everyone um, speak. But uh, I do, I think we should go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, Kay Dry is, uh, is first, the lovely young lady in the blue dress. Um, <laughs> and it's obvious that you all know Kay. I would suggest never get into an argument with her. Uh, okay, never expect to win an argument. That's really what it is. She is so knowledgeable. She has so much here to offer. She's been working on this uh, for, for quite some time. Um, next on the panel is Matt Levanchi. He is the assistant fire chief from uh, the Pattonville Fire District. He represents the first responders. And the reason that's so important, I think, especially on this issue, is that no matter what happens, no matter what in the world happens, the first person on the site is going to be him and his men. So as we, as we consider the impact to the entire community, we also have to consider the impact of those that have to respond and protect us, and to make that as safe as we possibly can. Matt has been a tremendous asset. He is there for the community. Uh, he has he has done as much for Patmo Fire District. I, I, it's part of my district, and I, I certainly um, maybe he's a little bit old for this, but I'm certainly proud of him and his department and the actions that they're taking right now. Um, Tom Perrin is with uh, the uh, St. Louis uh, County uh, Executive Office, um, and uh, he's here to offer us uh, a perspective, a little wider perspective, not just for here, but he represents the entire area and is part of that. And uh, we'll talk about some of the, uh, the health uh, department and those sorts of things. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, <laughs> and her fan club is here. <laughs> this is Dawn Chapman. I, I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if we went back on my phone and I've talked to her 15 or 16 times a day. There has been times when we, have, we, have, we, we are in touch she, she is, she simply represents, I don't even know what, she, she doesn't represent, she is part of the community. And she has stepped up and, and, and sometimes offers a voice, sometimes offers an ear, but the fact of the matter is, she lives in a community right, right close to the, uh, uh, to the uh, landfill and the waste, and she has been instrumental in keeping this in the public eye and keeping this the public awareness. Um, I'll give you my, uh, thoughts for, for a second here. I certainly am not an expert on this landfill at all. Um, 
I got drawn in. I got elected last year with Courtney. Uh, and uh, I, I was city council in Bridgeton from 89 to 95 when the landfill itself was active, when there was a lot of activity there. And the, what, the waste has been there for a long time. We certainly knew it was there. Um, and the idea is that the EPA was supposed to act. They were supposed to be acting on this for the last 25 years, or at 40. I think it just uh, hit a 40-year anniversary. Um, but, but we certainly were aware of it then and had expected movement, certainly uh, within uh, the last 20 years, the last 18 years since I got out of council, and obviously it hasn't happened. Um, just, just as a real quick synopsis, um, there is a, a, a landfill, an old landfill there, and when I say it's old, it's, it's an old non-technical landfill. It doesn't have a lining, it doesn't have a lot of the things. If you were to start a landfill now, or the one right across the highway, uh, used to be uh, Fred Weber, you all know where that is, where they're mining rock out of their stone out for the highways and concrete. Um, that, um, that's a, that's a, uh, that landfill is a modern landfill. It's lined, it's piped. Uh, they actually are, there's a portion of the landfill over there that um, Amarant is drawing the methane off of there, and they create 15 watts of power, which, which will, heat, uh, will provide electricity for 10,000 homes, and that's on the landfill, okay? They won't come to the other side because of the number one concern they have, they will not be involved in anything that, that might stir up that radioactive waste. So this is an old landfill, it's been there for a number of years, uh, the radioactive waste was moved, and I'm sure that will be covered here, uh, hopefully Kay will give a little bit, but the, most of this radioactive waste was dumped there from sites that have already been cleaned up in, in, in St. Louis. Um, you all know that uh, there's a smoldering event, as I call it, I just call it simply a fire. Um, deep down inside this landfill, it's burning. As it burns, and you could tell if you look at Google Maps and you see from the, uh, over the past few years, that it's, it has sunk in several places. Uh, and the reason is it burns, it creates uh, an ash, and then, it, then the landfill collapsed on top of it. That's why these pipes got broke that were in it, that pulled the methane out, and that's why there's so much smell. Um, that smoldering event, that fire, is in one portion of the landfill, a very deep portion, 200-foot landfill. It's moving toward the radioactive waste. They have uh, interceptor wells, there's all kinds of technology in there, but the matter of fact, no matter what you can do, what you say, or how you look at it, there's nothing infallible, and that radioactive waste could, or that fire obviously could and, and, and could potentially reach your radioactive waste, and that's a catastrophe here for wood. Now, as you all know, on Friday, Republic announced that they are going to dig a trench in this, uh, in this landfill, um, and I think it's on the north side. I don't know all the details about it. Like I said, I, I rely on these folks to keep me informed of, of uh, some of the technical aspects of this. But the fact is, they're going to dig a trench now, and that's supposed to be, that's where the fire is going to stop, and I'm confident, I, I think that uh, hopefully Matt will, will talk about this a little bit, and we'll have a high level of confidence that that's where the fire is going to stop. So to some extent, the, the, the issue of the, of the fire and the radioactive waste may be set on the back burner for a while. It may not be, but the fact of the matter is, no matter what they do with this fire, no matter what they do with this landfill, no matter what happens tomorrow, the radioactive waste is still sitting there. And I believe I came up uh, a couple of months ago, maybe a little longer than that, and said it's time to do something about that waste. Let's get it out of there. It's on the surface. You can drive by it. You can go swim in it if you want. It is, it is just improper the way it's set. And I'm sure I've, I've used my, my time here. So um, one other person I wanted to introduce is Harvey Ferdman in the back. Harvey is my... <laughs> If you don't want to try to get an argument with Kay, you don't want to try to outthink Harvey, because uh, the man's got more brains than I ever thought about. Um, anyway, so next I'll introduce Kay, and we'll just go through the panel and uh, have our words or two. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I can. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I think it's wonderful that we're having this meeting here tonight, and because I've been fighting radioactive waste for 40 years or more, and um, we have, I, I'm gonna read the first part of my speech, I would read the second part of my speech also, except I've left it somewhere in my house and I don't know where to go. <laughs> if you'd see my house, which is wall-to-wall -wall paper, you'd know how you can listen. 
<laughs> St. Louis has the unfortunate distinction of containing the oldest radioactive waste of the atomic age. A am I talking too loudly? Or is no, just loud? right, just right. Okay. Just one mile from downtown St. Louis, starting in April 1942, chemists and other workers at the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works, in total secrecy, began to try to figure out how to purify uranium needed to create atomic bombs for World War II. At that time, only a few grams, less than an ounce, of pure uranium existed, and tons were needed. Other chemical companies had refused even to try to work on this project because uranium catches on fire very easily. It's called pyrophoric. I learned, have learned a lot of words I've never known before, but that's what apparently pyrophoric means, is that things can catch on easily. And uranium was known to be dangerous, so the other chemical companies wouldn't go near this project. Mallinckrodt agreed to work to try to figure out how to purify tons of uranium, and they were successful in only 50 days. And on December 2nd, 1942, at the Fermi reactor under the football field at the University of Chicago, 60 years ago, the uranium purified here in St. Louis was used to create the world's first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. The atomic age was born. Unfortunately, however, the brilliant scientists who carried us into the atomic age were never asked if they could get us out. Some of the radioactive waste generated in 1942 and ever since will remain unsafe for living creatures and for our water, air, and land virtually forever into the future. Uranium-238, the first of Mallinckrodt's challenges, has a half-life of four and a half billion years, the age of the planet Earth, and you have to multiply the half-life by at least 10 to figure out how long uranium-238 will continue giving off radioactive radon gas and other harmful radioactive materials. Some uranium ore contains far more uranium than others, and Mallinckrodt was working with the purest uranium found on Earth at that time. The American government was willing to buy any ore, like during World War II, that contained at least 1% uranium, 1%. The best American uranium ore is just 1 or 2 percent pure, but the ore processed originally at downtown Mallinckrodt was 60 to 65 percent pure. It came from the Belgian Congo, now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Starting in 1945, after the power and devastation of the atomic bombs were revealed to the world, great quantities of the Mallinckrodt radioactive waste were trucked from downtown to a 22-acre site at the St. Louis airport along Coldwater Creek. The trucking of the uranium residues continued around the clock over an 11 or 12-year period, spilling, eroding, and blowing onto dozens of locations. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has either completed the cleanups of the uranium waste at almost all of the St. Louis city and county sites, or will complete the cleanups within the next couple of years. That is, at almost all the sites except Westlake, the Westlake landfill. Back in around 1960, the federal government had sold the extremely valuable airport site uranium waste for reprocessing. The airport materials, those that had been trucked out from downtown and, and placed in the airport site, the airport materials were dug up then and trucked a mile away to Laddie Avenue in Hazelwood, where they were dried to make them cheaper to transport by train to a mining company in Colorado. But the Laddie Avenue drying operation was abruptly shut down when the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission discovered that the workers and the site were becoming highly contaminated. Just as with the airport site, where they took the stuff from downtown Mallinckrodt to the airport, just as with the airport site, the Laddie Avenue site is located along Coldwater Creek that flows through North St. Louis County. As you may know, a large number of hardworking volunteers who grew up in Florissant and elsewhere in North St. Louis County have been collecting data from hundreds of people who lived near 
and played in Coldwater Creek. Their computer data are showing large numbers of birth defects and cancers, many of which are extremely rare. Appendix cancer, for example, averages just one per 500,000 people, or some, some medical texts say one in a million people. The North County Survey has already reports of 44 appendix cancers. Some of the wastes are the ones we're worrying about tonight, because in 1973, an uncertain number of, ton, of tons of, of, of radioactive waste that had been at Laddie Avenue were trucked secretly and illegally to the Westlake landfill and were dumped there in the Missouri River floodplain. The reason I have to write speeches is because I could talk for seven hours and you probably wouldn't appreciate it. And, but I've last, lost the last half of my speech, which Arlene Sandler, who was here tonight, helped me write, and it really was eloquent. <laughs> oh, you'll, take, well, you'll take, have to take my word for that. But, um, but what we have at at the at downtown Mellon Prot Chemical Works, which they're still cleaning up, that's on North Broadway, and still uh, some at Laddie Avenue, and on and really literally a hundred sites. Um, along people's houses, along roads where the stuff spilled off trucks and so forth. Um, it's very radiotoxic stuff. And in addition, what's particularly of great concern is that uranium is pyrophoric, and especially if it gets wet. And, and that means it can really catch fire easily. The EPA initially, at some, about 10 years ago or something like that, said, they were responsible for Westlake Landfill because it was a Superfund site. And they, the EPA said they were going to leave the waste at Westlake Landfill and put a, a top on it with uh, just some rocks and construction rubble and a little bit of clay and walk away from it and leave those highly dangerous materials in the floodplain of the Missouri River. The Missouri River is what North St. Louis County drinks. It also flows into the city of St. Louis's drinking water intakes. The Missouri River goes into the Mississippi River, and right below the confluence is where the St. Louis City drinking water intake is. And so it's used by the people who drink. That water is you drunk <laughs> by the people uh, in the city of St. Louis and North St. Louis County. And I, I might add, including, it's also, that water is also used by Anheuser-Busch and somebody, if anyone knows anyone at Anheuser-Busch, it would be nice to let them know that we could use their help in getting these radioactive wastes removed. These are very dangerous materials. And what we need is for every citizen, sort of, to take it on as his or her own task and try and convince our elected officials in Jefferson City and in Washington that we really do not want these materials left there going into our water and into our air. These are materials that will be radioactive literally for billions of years and, um, and we just can't have that happen. Thank you. Well, first of all, my name is Matt Levanche. I'm the Assistant Chief at Patton Hill Fire District, just like Bill said. I'd like to thank the two state representatives for inviting me tonight. Uh, I feel that the biggest part of this is the knowledge of the situation. And everybody that comes to these meetings, I hope, at least from my perspective, walks away with a little more knowledge of what they have coming in. There's a lot of great questions in the meetings that I've participated in. I don't have all the answers, but I do understand the science behind fire, so that's pretty much my expertise. I'm not a landfill fire expert. I know probably a hundred times more today about landfill fires than I did a year ago, um, but that's the extent of it. I understand what goes on above ground most of the time, but in this case, underground, and the chemical properties and the way things change. I'm also the commander, and it just so happens that Pattonville sits the, the landfill sits in the Pattonville Fire District, but I also happen to be the commander of the St. Louis County Hazmat Team, which is new, newly formed into one big group of the St. Louis County Hazmat Team and the Urban Search and Rescue Team, and it's now known as the St. Louis County Special Operations Team. So not that, that any of that is important, but I do have 
the experience in that. It just so happens I'm one of very few people in St. Louis County, and this landfill just happens to sit in my fire district. I would still be involved in it because I am part of that special operations team, but I wouldn't have the knowledge base for what I feel was very influential uh, access to certain people to help bring this thing to at least where it is today and I feel it's a, a lot more heading in the right direction today than what it was a week ago. Good evening everybody, I'm Tom Curran, I'm representing St. Louis County tonight and unlike Chief Levanchi or Ms. Dry who are experts in this field, I'm probably more like you. I'm someone that's learning about the situation and Thanks to Harvey Ferdman and the representatives. Uh, we've learned a lot at St. Louis County in the recent months in regard to the situation and uh, how serious it could be. So I wanted to just take a minute to let you know that County Executive Charlie Dooley has been in direct contact conversation with Carl Brooks, who is our EPA Administrator for Region 7, that's the Midwest states in which we're located uh, from a federal government standpoint. Uh, and we're taking this matter very seriously Again, thanks to Harvey and others, we're much more knowledgeable about this project than we were previously. And St. Louis County, through its Department of Health, does have certain responsibilities in regard to landfills, but I can tell you that from uh, the standpoint of the unique nature of this site, the radioactive materials, uh, that is beyond the scope and purview of normal permitting for uh, landfills in St. Louis County. I do want to mention a few technical things to you. Uh, Republic, uh, we're very glad to see that the physical barrier plan uh, has been at least submitted. Uh, we we're happy to see the EPA announcements from last Friday about the efforts. Uh, we think that it shows a newfound urgency on the part of Republic, uh, the landfill operator, so we're grateful for that. Uh, Republic is seeking approval from St. Louis County Health for a permit modification to process the waste products that are derived from the leachate pretreatment, in other words, materials coming off uh, the site uh, through an on-site transfer center. There are new uh, leachate tanks, or a new leachate tank, a million gallons, I believe, and Don is more expert than I, so four one million gallon tanks, thank you. Uh, St. Louis County Health Department has issued air pollution control construction permits to install two new industrial candlestick flares to replace two enclosed flares. These are the, the, the uh, operations that help burn off the, the gas from la the landfill. The facility has installed the first candlestick flare. Uh, it should be online this week. In Republic, again, the landfill operator will start dismantling one, one of the enclosed flares this week to make room for the installation of the second new flare. Uh, St. Louis County Health Department has current enforcement action against Republic. Uh, and the demolition contractor for failure to comply with asbestos requirements and applying for solid waste demolition approval. So from a regulatory standpoint, uh, those are some of the actions that we're taking. St. Louis County Health has also denied Republic's request to terminate their annual license renewal requirements for the demolition of the sanitary landfills uh, due to the ongoing impact of the subsurface smoldering event, which is the fire underneath, uh, that's preventing Republic from meeting our waste code requirements. So again, those are very specific things, but they are the things for which St. Louis County is responsible. We are, again, relying on the federal government and agencies that have more expertise and more authority than we do to deal with the situation and the rate of radioactive material. Uh, but again, we're learning just as you are. Uh, we've been in contact with EPA. We're very happy that they have responded uh, directly at the highest level to us. We take that as a good sign of things to come. And so I'm going to turn it over to Don Chapman, who probably can give you a different perspective on the recent activities. Thank you. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. My name is Don Chapman, and um, I'm just a mom. Bill's going to laugh. That's good. <laughs> I am. I'm just a mom. Um, I live in a community that's right next to Westlake Landfill and the Bridgeton Landfill, where the fire is. And um, honestly, I've lived where I've lived for maybe eight and a half, nine years, and I didn't know I lived next to a landfill, and I didn't know that I lived next to a super fun site. Not some place that I would have chosen to move and raise my children. You know, that's just not, it's not what I would have done. But I didn't become aware of either issue until I noticed a smell in my neighborhood, and 
I called Department of Natural Resources to find out what it was, and he says, well, you, you have a landfill fire. And I will say, um, Department of Natural Resources has spent a lot of time trying to educate people. You know, he spent maybe two hours on the phone telling me, and at the very end of the conversation, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, he says, yeah, you know, that fire, it's a big problem, but I gotta tell you, you live next to something even worse. And I just, <laughs> and I was like, okay. And he says, well, you, you live next to Westlake Landfill. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, Les, you know, Westlake Landfill, it's got the radioactive waste in it. And I was like, no, I didn't know that. Said, Tell me more about that. And he goes on and on, and I'm thinking, well, you know, surely it's buried under the ground. You know, it's in these, maybe it's in barrels. No. He broke that news to me pretty quickly. He said, no, well, actually. And then he finally says, you know, I need to send you stuff. I'm going to send you some information. <laughs> and so... I went, ran downstairs and got my email, and I just couldn't believe it. I really, I was like, this cannot be happening, no way. And so, back and forth, we went for a few days, and he took his time to educate me on Westlake. And then, he said, after he had, you know, I started asking questions, and he didn't know the answer, he said, you gotta go to the Environmental Protection Agency. And I, no, I didn't even know what that was. I'm like, okay, I gotta Google that one. So I get on and Google, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I call up there, and I'm like, I wanna know about this Westlake Landfill thing. And we start talking, and I say, yeah, I have this document in front of me. And she goes, I've never seen that document. <laughs> and then I knew we were in big trouble. I thought, okay, we really have a problem here. And so I emailed her that and some other stuff he had sent me, and she had never seen it, and I thought, okay, kind of a problem when the Environmental Protection Agency who's supposed to protect me with what's going on at this site doesn't know this stuff. So eventually, I literally called both of them up and said, okay, here's her email and you, here's his email. You need to talk. This is ridiculous. And that really kind of started me going. I thought, if I don't know this, they don't know this, we have a huge problem. And I reached out to State Representative Bill Otto, who Honestly, I, I think he felt the way I probably did when I started explaining it, and then <coughs> took me to Harvey Furman, who, um, Harvey works really closely with our community. But that's just how I got started. The really amazing thing is, um, sitting here in the front row, we have Karen Nickel and Beth Strohmeyer. You know, um, we've got people from Coldwater Creek. We've got, you know, grandmas and grandpas. We've got Chuck and Kathy Bell that live right on top in Spanish Village. You know, we've got Deb Levy over here. We've got people, from all over in our community, and we didn't know each other. We'd never met each other before, and we came together because we knew our community was in trouble. And what we've done, Karen started a Facebook page called Westlake Landfill almost a year ago. It's almost going on a year. And right now, we have over 2,600 people on that website keeping track. It really is amazing. What we've done is We've, we, we've come together as a community. We've decided that, to quote Aaron Rockovich, Superman's not coming. You know, we, we have to take control of the situation and we have to fight to make sure that people have the correct information so they can make the correct decisions to keep us safe. And I gotta say, I gotta give um, Kay Dry <laughs> applause. Kay has spent hours on the phone with me trying to teach me chemistry. I know more about radioactivity than I ever thought I would. And you know, where she succeeds in teaching me chemistry, Matt Levanchi has spent hours educating me on fires. And you know, when when you have when you have something horribly wrong in your neighborhood or even with your house or anything, and you're so scared, who do you turn to but your first responders? You know, and our first responders in our community, we're very, very close with them. We know them by name, they come to community functions, and so it's been really great to have that support and to know that they've taken the step up to protect us. So, that's it. All right, thank you. Thank you. If I could, I just wanted somebody that we didn't recognize and I think should be, is a community act advocate for us, for this entire process, and his name's Todd Thalhammer. And he's under contract with the Department of Natural Resources, so he basically can't talk publicly about this, but Todd's the one who taught me everything that I know about landfill fires. I have in turn taught Dawn, I think, somewhat, a little bit. But I took Todd's class a couple of times, and it actually, coincidence, probably not, uh, 
DNR held a class on landfill fires about three years ago. Right at the same time, he went under contract with DNR, and none of us had any knowledge of what was going on, but there was a reason why my chief, Terry Lohr, took the class, uh, because we knew we had two major, and actually, uh, Bridgeton Landfill is not the largest landfill in the state, but the one right next to Pattonville High School is, in, in IESI, which was formerly Fred Weber. Uh, there's two very huge landfills, and we all need landfills because every one of us make more trash than we should. Uh, and I'm not going to use this as a soapbox for any of that or anything else, but the problem is, is when those landfills were created, they made them out of quarries, which are contained boxes, which turn into tender boxes if they're not managed correctly. But they're right smack dab in the middle of a metropolitan area. And when they were started 50 years ago, they weren't. They were out in the middle of the country, but as you know, the city has grown and uh, spread out over the multiple miles. That's kind of where, why we're stuck in the situation that we're in. It's also one of the reasons why we can't go in there and just put it out, because I've heard that. If I've heard that once, I've heard it a thousand times. Why can't you just go in and put it out? I've heard that from fire chiefs around this area, and they just don't understand the emissions that are caused by that. The odors is the big thing, um, but the emissions from a fire reacting with waste and not radiological waste but just municipal waste is very different than the odor of a general landfill and you know when those things start to break down and they're heated up and plastic starts to smolder you know it's it's one of the phrases in the fire service is that every fire that we actually go on house fire structure fire things like that is considered a hazmat event because of the chemicals used to build everything that we use today um, so every time we walk into a fire, the smoke from a burning piece of wood is going to be hurtful to us, but the smoke from plastic, the bleach under the sink, everything that contains all that thing, those things are even more dangerous to us as first responders. So I just wanted to make sure that we recognize Todd, and if he could be here tonight to speak to the community, I know he would. I've, I've actually become very good friends with him uh, through this entire process. Like I said, he's taught me a ton of things. I've taken his class twice and I'm to the point now where I'm teaching in his class to other firefighters in the area because it's just something we don't have a whole lot of experience with, but it's something that's very deadly. Thank you. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask uh, maybe each of the panelists a specific question and let them respond and I'll let other panel members chime in. Please try to keep your remarks as brief as you can so we can include as many people as possible. I'll start with Bill, to remain on my immediate left. Do you think that the role of the state agencies, just as the firefighter was just telling us here just a second ago, uh, is changing since the EPA is actively uh, uh, monitoring the digging of the trench right now? The announcement of the EPA on Friday uh, is did, did uh, uh, have a substantial effect on this. Uh, right now, DNR um, and the Department of Health and Senior Services have been very, very involved in this, and I expect they'll continue to be, mainly because their task to um, monitor the air quality and, and the emissions and the things that come off of the landfill. Um, the one thing I glossed over earlier, and, and I certainly didn't for a long time, because I guess I'm resigned to it now, is when they open this trench, they're gonna open I know you all have, have driven by uh, Highway 270 and 70 and you smelt that sweet sort of sickening smell and the folks that lived close to there, it was terrible every day and all the time. Um, uh, those were from 20 foot in diameter holes, 20 foot in diameter. The trench you're gonna build is somewhere between probably 40 to 60 foot wide, 50 to 60 foot deep and 100 foot long. I have no idea what those emissions and those smells on that is gonna cause and that's a huge concern for me, the people that live close to the people in my district. But it is something, right now, those small holes they were smelling in St. Charles County. So I have no idea how far that's gonna go. It is up to the state agencies to, um, to monitor that, to protect the communities, and to make sure that the emissions that come out of that, or the smell is not so bad that it ruins people's quality of life, and then force Republic, and I don't mean bad, but make ensure the Republic does what they need to do to uh, not disrupt the lives of the people that live so closely. Okay, thank you, Bill. I'm gonna get down here so I can move the microphone around a little bit. 
and that and they have to keep passing it up and down. Miss Dry, that fire's way up in Bridgeton. Long way away. Why should we be concerned about it here in University City, Pagedale, Wellston, Benita Park? Why I mean, you know, we have a lot of problems in the state. Why that's a long way away. Why should we be concerned? That's that's over five miles away. Why should we be concerned about that? Down here in uh, St. Louis uh, County, and I, uh, I had one lady call me. Was interested. She said, "Oh, that's I, I live in South St. Louis County. I don't, I don't think I will be coming to your forum. I don't. It was a mistake on our mailing list or something. And she got a note. And she called me, and uh, I tried to talk to her, but she said, how would you have responded to that lady that called to me yesterday that said?" I live in South St. Louis County. Why should I be concerned about this? I live in University City. I live in Wellston. Why should we be concerned about a fire in Bridgeton? Well, for one thing, as I mentioned before, the, the radioactive wastes are in the floodplain of the Missouri River. And the Missouri River is what North St. Louis, well, Florissant and other places in North County, north of Highway of Interstate 270. That's the water they drink. But then after the water, in the Missouri River, you know, it goes ultimately into the water that St. Louis City drinks. Uh, and again, that Anheuser-Busch uses for its beer. I keep saying that because no one has the courage to pick up the phone and call Anheuser-Busch. I used to write to Anheuser-Busch about the Callaway nuclear plant, and, and I, I said it was like writing an entry in my diary, because I kept writing to them and they never answered, and I'm, I, that I haven't had very good... I think they should pay attention to the fact so it's not only drinking water, but also at one meeting that I attended some time ago, maybe um, after Mr. Levanchi was the one who told the public about this fire, and there was a, a meeting that the Teamsters attended, and um, someone said the waste at Westlake Landfill, if they caught on fire, could uh, be like a dirty bomb. And everyone jumped all over the man who said that. But the more I've talked with people, including today a man who knows as much about radioactive waste as anyone in the United States named Bob Alvarez, actually that could happen. Because uranium catches on fire easily, because they want to dig holes in the, in the, in the landfill to build a trench or whatever, then more oxygen will get to the fire and feed the fire. And the materials actually could turn the radio, a dirty bomb is a bomb that they've added radioactive materials to. There could be a major explosion. And, and it, it may sound like when people say that, that that's just trying to scare people, but it's, it's really for real. So we have a concern about our air that we all breathe and the water that we drink. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lowry? Right, Mr. Lowry. The Vanshee. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. How confident are you that the trench will work to keep the smoking, smoldering event, the fire, from reaching the radioactive waste? Sorry about mispronouncing your name. Well, that's not a problem. It happens all the time. I've been called much worse. So, <laughs> I just have a couple comments to your first two questions. The first one about the agencies being involved. I actually spoke with the EPA on Friday when the press release came out. And DNR is still in charge of, I should say, Missouri Department of Natural Resources, is still in charge of the municipal landfill. The fire event, the regula uh, regulatory portions of that, the EPA's involvement in that is only going to be overseeing the construction of the barrier wall. Second question that Ms. Dry had was, and my best answer for that would be, have you ever been in South County and it's raining and you notice on the weather report that it's also raining in North County? Happens here all the time, right? It's whichever wind, which way the wind blows when we're dealing with talking about radioactive material being Inter intertwined with a fire event. If, if those radioactive isotopes leach onto the smoke, it's whichever way the wind blows, and it might not be towards St. Louis or U City, but 
historically the wind prevailing winds in this area and we've looked into this is it comes from the north and heads to the south with a west to east direction so st louis is the biggest target potentially to be affected by the fallout that would come from radioactive waste being in the smoke caused by a fire my question that you've asked me is how how sure am i that the the wall the barrier wall is going to work basically what it is is a fire break and fire breaks are used in the fire service around the country most commonly in wildland fires that's how they try to stop forest fires from moving from one section to another and while we're not wildland firefighters here in st louis a fire break is known scientifically to be effective if it's wide enough and the correct material is used then it's effective in this particular case i've not seen the engineering plan that's going to be up to the engineers and, and i feel that there are very good engineers involved in this and the dnr has contracted like i said earlier with two of some of the best and those things will have to be signed off on uh, by the engineers who know the best the material that's going to be used as i understand it is an inner dirt type material gravel mixture as long as it's clean fill and not clean like it was called back in 1973 then we're going to be okay. Uh, I have every confidence that that barrier wall will do what it's supposed to do because we're, it's actually, and this is something that I like to hang my hat on <clears throat> with the community, it's a guarantee at this point that we didn't have last week. There's a plan in place, even though we haven't seen it, but we will look into that. Um, when that is made public, We'll have every opportunity, just like all of you who sit here and actively participate in getting the information off the website to see what those plans are. Nothing has ever been held from us, although they've been very hard to find at times. On the DNR's website, you have to really understand where to go to find it, and I even rely on Dawn sometimes because I can't find it, and I'm pretty computer savvy. Um, but that information has always been made public. Um, so I, I'm, I'm confident. The Patentville Fire District is confident. I think this community should be a little more at ease when we're talking about the fire event reaching that radioactive material. Mr. Dry, I want you to remember the question and the answer that the gentleman gave, and we'll come back to you in a few minutes for a response to that. But right now I want to turn to Tom and ask you, what should citizens do to make sure the region is prepared in case of a disaster? In, in your particular capacity in government and so on and who would be in charge or the plans being made uh, what should citizens do to make sure the region is prepared in case of, a, of a, this kind of disaster that, that could develop that's right you want the microphone as citizens i think the most important thing that you can do is exactly what you're doing now which is participating showing up expressing your opinion on this issue letting your elected officials know that it's critically important to you the example that don gave earlier the facebook page the number of followers that he's at 2600 those type of things matter to elected officials and we would like the loudest voice possible coming from the community to indicate that you're concerned about this issue and because this is so far beyond the scope of a normal county activity it's also important that we share that with our federal elected officials as long ago i believe it was 2009 but it was several years ago the st louis county council actually passed a resolution before anybody was talking about this as far as i know um, at this scale anyway saying that they did not approve and wanted that waste removed from the landfill in bridgeton and so that is part of the public record going back again i believe it was four years ago in 2009 uh, previous chair of the county council uh, was a county council person from university city and i believe that she led that effort and i give her a lot of credit for that so by participating in forums like this writing to your elected officials emailing you don't have no, not many people write these days emailing your elected officials not only at the county level uh, but particularly at the federal level I think is the most effective thing that you can do it's not up to average people like us who aren't chemists and who aren't experts in, in fires to solve this problem but what we can do is our, add our voice to that effort and I thank you for that all right thank you sir this, this is from Don um, this is from uh, one of you out, out there 
Uh, it seems like, uh, as a community, we've contacted EPA, but what is the EPA saying about why they won't or can't clean up the matter completely out there at Westlake? You understand that question? I have to chuckle a little bit on that one. Um, you know what, I'm gonna roll up my sleeves. My mayor just told me to roll up my sleeves, Karen Nichols, so I'm gonna roll them up. Um, the EBA needs to come to one of these forums and get educated. <laughs> and you know, um, and our senators. There you go. There you go. You know, there's a real lack of understanding what's at West Lake Landfill. And um, nobody can deny that right now. Mr. Harvey Furman back there, when ordinary citizens, um, this community can pull out a document and say, uh oh, you missed something. You know, I know that that may be embarrassing for the EPA, but they need to recognize it and they need to do a better job and they need to do it right now. And in regards to the question, what, what do I think is wrong with the EPA? Why aren't they moving or what are they doing? They're still studying it. That's, they're still studying it after 40 years. And they, they got a hold. It became a Superfund site in 1990. And they still, and I'm not joking, they don't know what background is on this site yet. How can you have a site with radioactive waste where you don't even know what background is? That is an epic fail. It's an epic fail, but you get an F for that. And so, right now, I, I, as a community, we are, we're come together, we're asking these questions, we're asking very specific questions and pointed questions in hopes that when it comes to the EPA dealing with the site, they will be able to look at those questions and say, gosh, we don't know the answers. Okay, we gotta find the answers. So we're actually trying to push the EPA to educate themselves. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it, it's the truth. So. Thank you. This next question will be Representative Otto. And I'd ask uh, when he finishes it, Ms. Dry would then respond uh, to uh, some of the answers and so on that have been given. How can we trust our different governments? And state, local, federal, uh, when many or several have known or should have known of the tremendous